Hello, hello. How are you doing, Encounter? Yeah. Oh, it's lovely to see you. It's always interesting when somebody from Texas says, I have an accent. It's a bit odd, actually. And thank you for making me feel at home. I miss Detroit. Uh, we, we lived there for 10 years, and now we're in Colorado, and quite frankly, I'm not getting as much exercise as I used to get, because not as many drive-bys, you know, so <laughs> you can... But it's nice to see you. It's good to be back down uh, in Texas. I was in Encounter a few years ago, and evidently they forgot all about that and invited me again. Um, I want to talk to you because there are competing stories going on. There are two main stories. The, the first story is the story told you by the world. The world says this, once upon a time, there was nothing, nothing, stop it, nothing. <laughs> and then there was a bet, um, and the bet floated about. It's quite attractive um, because other bets began to go to it. Don't ask where they come from. No. Then they started clumping together, and they got dense, and they got dense, and they got more dense, and all of a sudden, it blew up. It was horrific. It was terrible. It was a problem, but as it's spinning about, everything's on fire. Let's have a look at this one, shall we? Now, as it's spinning about, um, oh, uh, we have some ooze. There's some ooze on this one. It, don't touch. Very hot. Um, now, oh, something's wiggling. There's a wiggle. There's a wiggle in the ooze, um, but oh, it's growing scales and a tail, and look, it's frolicking in the water. Um, <laughs> And, and after a while, scales start falling off, legs go, and it says, I think I'll go for a walk, and it leaps. It leaps upon the now not-so-hot land, and it, hair, hair just, oh, it's amazing, it grow all over. And it, it runs up trees and eats produce, and then um, eventually the tail falls off, a uh, bit unstable now, so it comes down out the tree, and it shaves, and it becomes an evolutionist. So... <laughs> Basically, it's um, from goo to you by way of the zoo. <laughs> now, the other story is that you're important to a God that made you. But here's the thing. Um, if, if you take a good look in the mirror, which I don't do. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't want to start the day crying and screaming and begging. So my wife, however, my wife's, um, oh, she always wants me to bring this up. She's American and normal. There you are. Um, she, she's an interior designer. And so she put in like these five Klieg lights in our bathroom. I don't know why. And there's huge rheostats, like the size of a pie plate over here. And I didn't pay attention because I'm a guy. So I, I went to use the bathroom in the night and clicked the light on and these things were set to broil. You know, and I, my, the tan was nice, but my first thought was, yes, Lord, you know, um, really didn't want to get caught there, but there you are. Um, but if you look in the mirror, the devil will tell you stories about yourself. He'll say, you know, the Lord can use a lot of people, but not you so much. Thanks for asking. You're too sinful. You're too fat. You're too crooked. You're too straight. You're too tall. You're too pretty. You're too something. And you've done stuff. Oh, you've done stuff. You're not like the heroes in the Bible. No, thank you. Those people are very good. You can even buy superheroes of the Bible toys. I've seen them. I, I even bought one. I bought a wind-up Jesus. <laughs> it's amazing. Because you just wind him up and he blesses you. You know, and... Uh, sure how authentic it is because the same store I got a nun with boxing gloves puppet um, but he'll say you know superheroes of the Bible and you're looking and there's Samson and oh there, there's David and there's you know there's uh, Saul no he didn't quite make the cut uh, there's Jesus there's there's Paul that one he, he made it in um, and you, you go oh those are great people I'll never be like them or Mary 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 <laughs> Mary First of all, she's white, which was quite a surprise, actually, when you see her in the paintings, because uh, first century Jew. Anyway, um, 
And she's always holding Jesus. Now, it might be the baby, in which case it's called Madonna, or uh, Diane Jesus, in which case it's La Pieta, but whatever, she's, same pose. And um, she's wearing royal blue with the, the white headband thingy, and she's glowing like a dollar store nightlight. Have you ever noticed that? And her, and her head's always turned like the photographers make you do. You're like, no human ever does. Uh, and we're going, that's Mary. We think of Mary. We don't understand. These are real people. The stories the devil's going to tell you about yourself are amazing. When I was a boy, uh, back, uh, back then, the dinosaurs still roaming the earth. It was, it was an amazing thing. Uh, when I was a boy, uh, my dad was a very famous preacher uh, in his circles, shall we say. Uh, and we lived in seven countries growing up because we couldn't get on with anybody. And, and so as we went around, and all the famous preachers of the churches of Christ would come through and they'd stay with us. And one time we had a bunch of them and we ran out of sheets for the bed. And so my mom made up a little pallet for me and she had to use a sermon sheet. Now back then, you didn't have PowerPoint. So what you do is you took a bed sheet and you painted on it what your sermon was and you hung it up and you whacked it with a stick every now and then and it was quite impressive. So she, we ran out of the normal sheet, so she made one of the, and I pulled back the covers and it said, where are the dead? <laughs> my mom's Irish, she has a sense of humor that needs to be worked on, uh, frankly. I asked my dad once if I was adopted and he goes, yeah, but they brought you back, you know, and. <laughs> I'm not done. So I went to my mom thinking, oh, the wee Irish lady mom, she'll be nice to me. And I said, "Um, was I adopted? And she said, sweetie, you have to be patient. We just put the ad in last Thursday. (laughs) Don't awe me, medication's wonderful. And now, (laughs) I knew when I listened to these preachers talk in my mom and dad's house, and I know sometimes even now, I'll sit and I'll listen to, to Josh Ross and Jonathan Stormont and Joshua Graves and uh, Adam Hill and all these great preachers and they're talking back and forth. I'm getting about every fourth word because I don't speak theological ease. I didn't go to preacher school. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but that's how they could afford me because I'm on the cheap. Anyway, um, I, I asked God, I said, there's, there's really no place in this church for me, is there? Because you'd see worship ministers, oh, worship ministers. Oh my goodness, worship minister. Somebody just needs to go and just leave them in a field. (laughs) They're worse than aerobic instructors. They'll say one more time. It's never one more time. (laughs) They'll say, I'll do a few songs. They're out there for five years. They've got energy and the like, and they're ready to roll, and I'm not. I'm not at all. My my wife, normal American girl, she likes people. (laughs) She'll sit there and she'll say, you know what would be fun? It's never fun. (laughs) We should have people in our house, around us, with you here. I'm going... Uh, what's the fun part? <laughs> and I, uh, see, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit of a loner. If I, uh, introvert, if I can see you, you're invading my personal space. <laughs> and, and so I assumed there is no place for me in the kingdom of God. Plus, I know things about me. I'm not a nice person. I wish I was, I'm just not. A few years ago, I flew into to Little Rock. I was supposed to go up to speak at Harding. I landed, it was in the summer. First thing is I landed and it was like 105,000 degrees. <laughs> I just get off the plane and I go, oh. why did they put a Christian school in hell? <laughs> so, so then I drive up to scarcely Arkansas because it's almost not there. And I realized on the way up, I, I forgot my deodorant. This could be a bad day. So I went to Walmart where everybody eventually goes if you die outside of Christ. And so as I was driving, I'll give you time. Um, so I was driving in the parking lot. This guy stepped in front of me. Now he saw me. That's important. He saw me. 
and a still attitude stepped in front of me. He's about 15 years old, white, dressed like he was from the ghetto. I was from Detroit, and I'm going, seriously? In Searcy, Arkansas, this, really? And he looked at me and he just gave me attitude, flashed a gang sign. My first thought was not, oh, bless that child. I wish it was, I really do. I wish my first thought was, oh, I bet he doesn't have much of community. I'm gonna get out of this car and hug him. No, my first thought was, you're flashing me a gang sign. I could kill you with a magazine. Don't encourage me, that was wrong. The point is, Satan will remind me of this and say, there's no place for you. There is no place for you in this kingdom. You don't preach like other preachers. You don't think like other preachers. And maybe you should do something else. And I get that, I do. And not everybody should be preachers. And I wonder about myself sometimes with that too. I do gut checks on that. Here's the thing though. There's another story that's not goo to you by way of the zoo. There's not a story, it's, it's a better story than once there was nothing that it blew up. I used to live right across the water from Northern Ireland and it blew up a lot. I never saw a post office blow up and go, oh look, pandas. It doesn't make stuff, it unmakes stuff. That's what a bomb does. Anyway, God has another way of doing this. He says, you are unique and made on purpose for the kingdom of God. And I know you're thinking right now, that's generally true, but not with me. Work with me just a minute. Um, there are about 10 to the 62nd power atoms in the universe. I didn't count them. I'm just taking this on somebody's word. Physicist word. However, we can take the DNA from one girl and one boy in here and make 10 to the 128th power individuals, no copies. In other words, you are hundreds of thousands of times more unique than the universe in which you live. Every so often, I'm, I find myself surrounded by idiots. <laughs> we'll be standing out at night looking up at the stars, and I know somebody's gonna do it. Usually it's a young lady being all romantic-like. She'll go, ah, look at the stars. I don't know why she's English, but she is. So beautiful. So vast. So far away. Doesn't it make you feel small? No. It's, it's a burning rock. I'm over it. But me, on the other hand, I am amazing. And that's usually, that's usually when they leave, but The point is still valid. We're not gonna get another one like you. You are completely unique. I lived for eight years in West Virginia. I love those people. They're sweet people, nice people. That's where I got the accent and all. And, and <laughs> I worked there with West Virginia University and it's a very bumpy state and, and therefore a lot of people get engineering degrees. You have to, to get anywhere, do anything. So. Ever so often you'd get these two engineers and they'd marry each other and they'd decide after a while to run some computer simulations and, and they're going to have a baby. So, all right. A few years later they'd come in. They're there in their suits with their briefcases beside them. There's the baby, <laughs> trying to eat the chair. And they'd say, there's something wrong with our child. Um, we're trying to show them flashcards of the great composers and. Uh, they're, you know, they're eating them and we're, we're trying, to, trying to teach them French and, and they're burping a song, you know, and there's something wrong. And I'll say, no, this is quite simple. God had a look at you too and went, not doing that again. And, <laughs> like that. Worked the other way as well. Sometimes you get these people come in still hiding from Vietnam. We, didn't, we don't tell them it's over. 
They come in, long hair, little John Lennon glasses, you know, army fatigues with peace symbols on Birkenstocks. And they're sitting there beside a three-year-old in a three-piece suit reading the Wall Street Journal. And they're saying, dude, like there is something wrong in stuff with our kid. And um, I'm going, well, Dweezil and Moon Unit, um, God had a look at you and said, well, that gene pool needs some chlorine. And, <laughs> Here's the point. You're not your mom and dad. You're not me. You're not anybody else. And if you try to live your life like somebody else, you're going to lose your life. So what are you going to do? You're going to give whatever you've got to God. Now, you might think, I don't have much. Have you read the Bible? The loaves and fishes thing is not about God being able to make stuff. We got that over in Genesis 1. <laughs> so why are we doing making stuff again? Here's the way it works. Jesus is preaching. The apostles notice he's been going on a while. Got 5,000 guys out there, and every now and then one of them goes, eh, thump. <laughs> so they come up to Jesus and say, you might want to wrap it up. I think that's really cool, telling God, let's cut it short. <laughs> People are hungry. They got to go a long way to get food. You couldn't just go to Mac Falafel. You know, it's, it's, it's hard to find food back then, so got to get them out. So. Jesus just turns to them very casually. I love this. It's quite hilarious. Turns to his apostles. Oh, get him something to eat. Go, okay, sure. <laughs> we got unemployed fishermen. They haven't had a job for a long time. They're going, oh, geez, what do you have? Um, oh, sorry, Jesus didn't. Oh, what do you have? And, um, I've got um, Tic Tac, something fuzzy. Um, so they, the Bible says that they brought this boy to him that had his mom had packed a lunch had some bread and fish. Now, it does, I've seen the painting, and the painting, little boys <laughs> offering it to Jesus. No way. <laughs> no. No, no, no. Didn't say that. They said they brought the boy who had the food. Why? He's the only person who, whose mama packed a lunch. There are 5,000 hungry people, and all of a sudden, Jesus' posse has shown up. <laughs> My nice food you got there. <laughs> Might want to share that with the group, won't you? <laughs> I imagine they're wrapped around, he's wrapped around it right now. Hey, hey. And so they just pick him up. <laughs> There's not enough food. And Jesus goes, oh, line everybody up. All right. In every Jesus story, there comes a moment where I ask myself if I would have done it. Would you have lined people up for this? You got 5,000 people and two bologna sandwiches. <laughs> You're going to line them up? I wouldn't have. I would have created a diversion and run. <laughs> I really would. Elvis! And, and... <laughs> I would have. But they line them up and you can just go, oh, geez, what are we going to do? I don't know. Pry the kid loose. The kid's going. That's my mom's baskets, which are like... Tupperware for them, you know, and unless they were longer burger baskets, which is a, a German word, meaning we have all of your money now. And um, so, <laughs> so they go, all right, here we go, line them up. Look who got in front of the line, Mr. Uh, love others more than yourself. And there you go, yeah, there, yeah, yeah, there. We got food, look at that. I said, line them up, man. You want seconds? Here's a little something extra for you. There you go. And at the very end, Jesus says, pick up the leftovers, which is a hoot as well. I'm sure he gave them to the little boy who was still over there going, my mama, I don't care who you are. <laughs> my mama's going to get you. <laughs> and Jesus didn't want to spend eternity explaining that one. So he gave him the, the, the leftovers and he had more than he began with. It's very cool. Here's the thing. The point is this. You don't have to have much for Jesus. You just have to give them what you got. And it may not be that much. That's what the stories of the Bible are like. You know, I, I like the story that happened in Nashville here last year. Uh, YouTube did a, a, a big concert there. And on the front row, there was a blind guy holding up a sign that said he knew how to play one of their songs. All, all, I, all I need is you. And as the, the band left, Bono looked, walked up and said, and you can hear it if you go to YouTube and, and the people took video of this. He says, you know how to play that song? And the guy goes, yes, I do. And, he's, and he reached down 
And they, the, you hear the other people saying, he's reaching for your hand because he's, he's blind, you know. And, and Bono pulls him up on stage, hands him his guitar, and he plays it. And it's a great, wonderful moment. At the very end, he gives him his prized Gibson guitar. That's a beautiful thing. Everybody here wishes we were either blind man or Bono. Uh, really. You want to be the kind of person that goes, I give this to you, I am famous and I can. Or a famous person gives us something. That's what we would like. But most of the time, when we give something to God, it's not quite as pretty. It's, it's rather like Moses freeing the slaves. Moses, free the slaves. Isn't that where I'm wanted for murder? Yeah, go there. I'm 80. Go, it's all right, here's a stick. We don't even know if it was a pointy stick. It might have been a non-pointy stick, which would have been considerably less dangerous, especially when welded by an 80-year-old who needed to lean on it the whole time. And yet, look what God does. I think it's really fun when he throws it down and turns into a snake. The Bible says he ran from it. I'm thinking, it probably wasn't running. It was probably, okay. (laughs) Here's the thing. They're not superheroes. I love the story of Gideon. The story of Gideon's the first Western. It really is the Western. The bad guys have taken over the town, Midianites. One of the first things they did is, give us all your weapons and we'll treat you nice. That's never worked. <laughs> of course, here I'm telling that to Texans. <laughs> Sometimes when I'm driving through other states, I do wonder about them. You know, you get pulled over in Massachusetts and they say, do you have any weapons? What do you need? Oh, oh, sorry, no. No, I don't. That would be completely wrong. I would hate to bring a sharp stick in and frighten Massachusetts and make them run away. So, or the French. Oh, no. Uh, Anyway. um, (laughs) Sorry. That's why they eat snails. It's the only animal they're brave enough to hunt. Oh no, Henri, I think we have wounded him. We must flee. Anyway. <laughs> so, Judges chapter 6. You thought I forgot I didn't forget. Quit annoying me. Now, Judges chapter <laughs> Midianites have taken over the town. Everybody's afraid of them. Nobody has a weapon. And so God goes and finds Gideon. And you might think, Gideon? No, no. Gideon was hiding, trying to thresh wheat indoors, which is a bad idea. It's very nasty. And so he's in there going, Shh. He's a coward. He really is a coward. So God walks in and goes, hey, almighty warrior. I think he's being a bit sarcastic, quite frankly, God. <laughs> and Gideon looks at him and goes, well, who are you then? And he goes, I am God. And Gideon basically goes, well, what do I care? You've not done anything for us recently. This is not going well. <laughs> and God says, no, I want you to rise in the strength you already have. And overthrow the Midianites. What? <laughs> this is not a general. This is not a soldier. This is a coward trying to make bread in secret. (laughs) So you can talk to me all the time about, well, I don't really have all these gifts. You're better than Gideon. (laughs) And God looked at Gideon and said, arise in the strength you already have. Gideon's getting a little concerned about who it is that's come to see him. So he figures God might be hungry. And he says, I'll go make you some goat soup and some bread. I don't know why he thought God would like goat soup, but he then goes out. I love the next line. It says, he prepared a goat for the sacrifice. And I'm thinking, how do you prepare? I know what they mean. He means you wash him up and... But I get this picture of him putting his arm around a goat saying, well, you know, goat, we've been together a long time. But... <laughs> so before he leaves, though, he looks at God and he goes, don't go anywhere while I'm cooking. <clears throat> God goes, Okay. He does. It's in the Bible. <laughs> Goes, brings it back. God looks at it, throws it out, and fire. <laughs> Evidently, not a good cook either. <laughs> he says, I told you what to do. So there's, there's some other bits going on in between. None of them make him look any better. Uh, God even tells him, go tear down that idol to a false god. So he does it in the middle of the night and then says somebody else did it. <laughs> Hides in his dad's tent and says, don't tell this is, this is who God picks. 
So he pulls him out saying, right there, the Midianites, gather your men. So he gathers the men. Most of them don't have weapons. You know, they're there, you know what are you going to do? I'm going to head, it, head them with Harry. You know, that's, you know, <laughs> Harry's going to hold himself for all stuff. You know, but anyway, <laughs> that bet's not in the Bible. Now, God looks at him and goes, you know something? I think you've got too many men. <clears throat> wow, you hate to go into battle with too many men. <laughs> so he says, ask him if anybody would like to go home. Anybody like to go home? Almost all of them go. God goes, let them go. Now you know the rest of them are going, dude, is it, is it too late? <laughs> then he says, go, go let them get something to drink. So they go down. And by the way, they're drinking. He says, all right, the ones that are drinking that way, send them home. I don't want to. They got lots of guys. Oh, my God, these. So now he's only got a few hundred. So God's got this battle plan. But he says, before we launch the battle plan, send some spies down into the camp. So they send some spies down to the camp. God's got a sense of humor. They come back and they say, we heard some people dream. They said they were dreaming weird dreams last night that a guy named Gideon was going to thresh them like wheat. <clears throat> yeah, I know. God's up there going, Michael, what's this? Uh, anyway. So God says, all right, here's the battle plan. You're going to need a jug and a torch. And some trumpets would be nice. <laughs> Have you noticed there's nothing sharp here? There's nothing pointy. What are we, what are we going to set them on fire, put them in a jug, play a song? What? <laughs> you know the story. They light the torches in the jug. <laughs> then all of them break the jugs. And the people look around, they see all the fire, so, and they go, oh no, there are lots of them. And they run away and they kill each other on the way. Now, well, I'm sure they didn't think that was funny. But anyway, <laughs> the point of it is, he wasn't all that great unless he gave the little bit he had to God. That's it. Think about Esther. Esther, great hero of the Bible. What'd she do? I love the story, mind you. First of all, King Xerxes stomping around the palace. King of 127 provinces. He has had a party going on for six months. They're a little drunk. <laughs> so he goes, you always pray. My wife's gorgeous. <laughs> so I bring her out here. And she went, no. And, and then he's going, well, that doesn't look good. And so they all gathered around and said, here's the problem. If you let her get away with that, women will start thinking they can disobey us. Pfft, that'd be tragic. So he made a rule. He liked making rules. He made a rule. No woman may ever, that woman may never come near me again. Everybody goes, well, you showed her. Then they realize, well, you're effectively divorced now. You don't have a wife. And he's going, oh, dude, I hadn't thought of that. So, so he sends people out to look at all the pretty girls. And they found Esther with a bunch of others. And they, they put her in this place to fatten her up for a while because they didn't like thin girls back then. They, you needed special treatments. <laughs> Lots of food. And, and so... Uh, they, they made, you know, here she comes out, she's, she's doing all right. But now, then this other guy, her uncle comes to follow her. What did her uncle do? Uh, it's what he didn't do. There was a guy that was a best friend of the king named Haman, and every time he went away, around anywhere, people uh, flung themselves to the ground going, oh, great Haman, and uh, this guy didn't. He was on, he didn't fling. <laughs> he, was, he was a non-flinging Jew. That annoyed Haman. So, and, and even, I'm not making this up, he even went by him another couple of times to give him a chance to fling just in case he missed him. <clears throat> and so he goes in, he goes, I got an idea, king. Um, why don't we make a rule that on a certain day we can kill all the Jews? Because that wouldn't be an overreaction or anything. <laughs> and we can pay for it by keeping our stuff. And the king goes, oh, <laughs> can't say no to you, and you know, stamps it, idiot. Um, he really was, by the way. Later on, he would lose a battle, a, a naval battle, and he blamed the sea, had a court martial of the sea, found it guilty, I'm not making this up, and sentenced it to being flogged and had all his soldiers stand there while the guy beat the sea. <laughs> all right. Not a very stable guy. So, anyway. 
So what's, what's going on with Esther all this time? Not much, eating, you know, uh, rubbing stuff in her skin. That's pretty much it. Now, after a while, Mordecai goes, he goes, now, here's the deal. Um, I want you to call the king in and uh, give him a nice supper and then tell him, please don't kill us because he doesn't know you're a Jew. And she's going, I don't know. It's a little dangerous. And Mordecai says something interesting. He says, maybe you came to the kingdom for such a time as this. But if you don't do this, God will go find somebody else. In other words, you do what you can do or God will find somebody else. He's not waiting for a superhero. He's not waiting for us stars here. You know, it, that's not what he's looking for. So she goes to the king. Very dangerous. You're not supposed to go to the king unless he told you to go. But he goes and the, he, the, the king goes, that's all right, don't kill her, bring her up. And she goes, um, he, and he's, he's <laughs> besotted with her. And he's saying, ooh, I'll give you anything, even half my kingdom. And um, she didn't take that. She said, would you come to eat with me and maybe bring Haman? He goes, oh, yeah, I'll do that. So they have a nice dinner. He goes, what do you want? What do you want? And she goes, no, just come back tomorrow. They go back, Haman, so, you know, I got to eat with uh, the king and his honey bunny, you know, woohoo. And um, <laughs> on his way home, uh, Mordecai is standing there going, not flinging, and it made Haman so angry. So <laughs> that night, the king couldn't sleep. Evidently, her cooking wasn't that good either. And so he had people read to him from the, from the rules, the, the law book. And they had this thing about these two guys that had tried to kill him, but then they'd gotten caught, and this person turned him in. And he goes, what did we ever do for that Mordecai guy that turned him in, saved my life? And he goes, oh, we didn't do anything. He goes, oh, that's interesting. So next night, here comes Haman. He's, <laughs> the king says, you know, what would, you, what would be a great gift to give somebody who the king really, really likes? Haman thinks he's talking about him. He goes, and Haman's not a deep thinker. He says, ooh, if the king would let him wear his clothes and ride around on a big horse. <laughs> that, that's what you came up with? <laughs> he says, okay, do that for Mordecai, and you lead the horse around. <laughs> oh, he didn't like that. So he goes home afterwards. He's done it all day. He builds this huge, tall gibbet in which to hang Mordecai. Goes to dinner. Eunuch brings him. Lots of eunuchs in the story. It's not a happy kingdom. <laughs> <laughs> so, they're there, and the king goes, this is the second night in a row you've been feeding me, and I love you so much. What can I do for you? And she says, well, would you just not kill us? What? Well, there's, he says, who would want to kill you? She goes, well, Haman. <laughs> He's over there. <laughs> he didn't know she was a Jew. No, he does. So King gets mad, stomps out, and he walks out for a while. Haman flings himself, not making it up, on Esther about the time the king walks back in. Bad timing, Haman. <laughs> king standing there looking at this, when another eunuch's looking outside saying, oh, look at that, it's a big hanging thing. Nobody's on it. Wonder who we could put there. And the king's going, I got an idea. Now the point is, what superhero thing did Esther or Mordecai do? Nothing. They just played the part they had. And you don't have to be a superhero. I love, for example, Acts 16. We think of Paul. Paul wrote most of the New Testament, more, more of the New Testament than anybody else and all that sort of thing. Acts chapter 16, here's this slave girl walking around saying, these people are from the Son of God. And this, because she has a demon that won't shut up. And so Paul throws the demon out. And we think, oh, that shows the power of God over demons. And that shows, you know, no, no. The Bible said he did it because he was annoyed. <laughs> Paul wasn't easy to work with. It's like, shut up, woman, get out. And, and that was... It wasn't even a good sermon. And then they got in trouble with it and had to go to jail. And it was about... Any, the point being, the Bible said he was annoyed. You, what, you might think, well, I, I don't act like the people in the Bible. Good. <laughs> They're a mess. Look at David. He broke seven commandments in one day. <laughs> You've got to try. The only one worse was Moses. He broke all ten at the same time, if you remember that. But... <laughs> the devil will tell you your past keeps you from being useful. 
Every time the devil reminds you of your past, remind him of his future. I'm not going to burn. You're not going to burn. You believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? You've been buried with him in baptism? You're not going to burn. You don't have to walk around going, I wonder if I'm saved. Seriously? I've got a son and a daughter. They're both grown now, much larger than me. Interesting people, love them. But they're grown. They never have to walk around saying, I wonder if I'm still the son. It's a relationship. We're in it. We belong to each other. You understand that? Let me put it to you this way. My son, he's now out of the Marine Corps, big six foot five guy. Don't ask. I don't know how it happened. So, I, I really, I, we're about the same size when it comes to cubic centimeters of skin, but I, I use some width. You know, anyway, um, <laughs> when he was a wee boy, he wanted to learn how to play baseball, and I don't know anything about baseball, but I went, all right, fair enough. So we went out. He's a little guy. This wasn't Little League. This was, these kids dreamed of one day being able to make Little League. And so, you know, every time they stood out there, it looked like one of these precious moments dolls with a bobblehead, because the helmet was so big, you know, just kind of wobble around them. They'd turn around, it didn't move, and... Had a pitching machine, kind of squishy ball. You know. His team stunk. <laughs> oh, absolutely. It was the ADHD league. They had no idea what was going on. <laughs> Shiny piece of paper floated across the outfield. Dirt. You know. <laughs> it was over. So he gets up to hit the ball one time, and it's only fair to say there was not a great air of anticipation in the dugout because <laughs> nobody had ever gotten a hit. He's standing there. Boop. Well, they'd aimed the machine wrong, so it just kind of brushed his arm. And they said, oh, you got to go to first base. And everybody came out of the dugout, because nobody had seen anybody make that trip before. <laughs> Stood there, but slow learners, they didn't adjust the machine. Next guy gets up, bloop. you got to go to first base. And so they stood there and talked a while until they said, no, Duncan, you actually get to go to second now. So he went out to second, you know, he's going, look, da, I'm far. And I'm going, God. <laughs> I can see our house from there. It's, it's not our house, but okay. <laughs> Next guy gets up. He's terrified. He's just seen two of his comrades go down in battle. <laughs> well, they adjusted the machine, but he's having none of it. He's standing there just shaking. <laughs> Goes bloop. He falls into the fetal position. <laughs> the ball hits the bat and rolls forward six inches. That's a hit. Coach is screaming, run, run, and, and the kids are running. He's going, not you, you know. And he's yelling, to, you know, Duncan's looking around because something flew by, I guess, and he's saying, saying, run home base, and he dead, God bless him, right over the pitcher's mound. And I grabbed him and I swung him around. I said, I said that was brilliant. They weren't expecting that. Now, the other kids on the team never really hit the ball and never caught the ball and weren't even aware there was a ball involved half the time. <laughs> but my son was brilliant because he was my son. Do you understand that? God looks upon... I don't care what your dad's like. I wish they were all wonderful. I know some aren't. Your heavenly Father is. And he looks at you with even more love than I looked at my son. And you might say, but I can't catch the ball. I can't hit the ball. I'm not aware where the ball is. Is it? Am I here? You're confused. <laughs> when do we get snow cones? <laughs> but he still thinks you're brilliant because you're his. So I'm not going to burn. Devil's going to burn. All of his stuff's going to burn. I'm not going to burn. You're not going to burn. We belong to Jesus. We're in the family. And once you're in the family, you just stay in the family and offer what you've got to the family. This is what I can do for you. My parents are now both in their 80s. I can't do much for them. I can't make them younger. I can't pay their medical bills. <clears throat> There's a lot I can't do for them. So every now and then I fly 
Go see them. Sit with them. Sometimes we don't even talk. They don't have anything to say. Nothing's happened since the last time I was there. <laughs> so we just sit quietly. But that's what they wanted. I'll give that to them. The kingdom of God is you showing up in every moment with whatever you've got, confident you're saved, so let's just do a little bit of good while we're here. An act of kindness. I can't give him a Gibson guitar, but maybe. You know, I'm a guitar player. I can teach people how to play. And I'll go to Guitar Center sometimes and just sit down and start playing, and other people gather about, and we'll talk about things. I can do that for them. I don't know. Yay. I, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I don't know how to do preacher stuff. But I'm going to show up with everything I've got. That's all God wants. And what if you're really horrible and you've done horrible things? Join the club. Have you read the Bible? <laughs> Abraham, oh, stop it. He sold out his wife twice to save his own sorry skin. <laughs> God still liked him. David's kids tried to kill him. That's a sign you might not be a good dad. <laughs> God still liked him, put a lot of his poems in the Bible. God has a place for you. God can use you. But like Mordecai said to Esther, you kind of have to show up. And the first showing up is to say, I belong to Jesus. I'm choosing sites. I'm choosing, I belong to Jesus. Now I'm going to do it wrong. I'm going to be a mess. There are going to be problems. But whatever the devil wants to tell me my story is, is wrong. I'm not goo. I'm not a mistake. I was created on purpose by Almighty God. And he's going to use me for something. Whatever it is, I'm comfortable with it. I'm just going to follow him. So we start tonight. Thomas is going to come out here. I've known Thomas for years. He still likes me, he says. <laughs> you never know. He's going to lead us in a song. That song is going to be a song of invitation. Now, you can do this many ways. You can decide to talk to God where you are. But if you've never been baptized, you need to be baptized. Find your youth leader. Talk to them. Or you can come down here and we'll get your youth leader and we'll talk to you. We'll get you in. Because God doesn't say, well, I don't know if you're good enough. He says, whosoever will may come. You don't even have to look. Let me tell you one more story. Can I do that? All right. Who cares? All right. I didn't actually get to my notes tonight and they're dead solid brilliant. They are just are wonderful. I'm sorry. Maybe later we'll just talk. Anyway. My dad called me from Guyana, South America, and he said, there's this wee girl, her, her mom's dead, her dad deserted her, they're about to sell her to the mines, and that's what they do. And I want to adopt her, but the problem is, the, the nation says I'm too old, he was in his 60s then, and I told him, I've got a son, what if my son signs that he would raise her if something happened to me, and they said that would be all right, would you do that? And I said, absolutely. So long story short, I ended up getting, when I was in my 40s, a 12-year-old sister from Guyana, a Carib Indian, and that's my sister. And if anything happens to my father, she becomes my daughter. So after a year or so, I said, you know something, we need to take you to Scotland. So we had to drive into Canada from Detroit to fly because it's cheaper and I'm Scottish. So we had to cross two international borders to get her in, you know, Canada and Scotland. So we're there. And they're looking, you know, I'm so white, you can read through me, you know, and there's all my family. And then there's this dark-skinned girl, long black hair, and they're saying, who's she? I said, that's, that's my sister. <laughs> Unless something happens, then she's my daughter. <laughs> and they would look at me, and I'd say, no, no, it's all right. I've lived in West Virginia. This will work. Remember the guy in Glasgow looked at me and he goes, and why do you want to come to Scotland? I said, to show her where she's from. <laughs> he just said, just go, just go. <laughs> you don't have to look like a hero. You don't have to look like everybody else. You don't have to act like everybody else. You just have to join the family and walk with the family. <laughs> you ready? If you're ready, Choose sides. Let's stand and sing.